Thank you so much to Kathy and to Cricket for that very generous introduction and to everybody who had a hand in uh, inviting me here and in organizing this visit. So far, it's really been fabulous, and um, there's a, such a lively community of engaged people to talk to, and I'm getting all kinds of good ideas, and I hope to get some more good ideas from you tonight as I try out um, something that is brand new, probably not 100% ready for prime time, but I thought I'd go with it. And so I am going back to my original title. You can see the uncertainty I, I've been going through, which is what should socialism mean in the 21st century? Well, the word socialism is back. For decades, this word was considered an embarrassment, a despised failure, and a relic of a bygone era. No more. Today, politicians like Bernie Sanders and Alexandra, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez wear the label proudly and win support, while organizations like DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, attract new members in droves. But what exactly do these people mean by socialism? However welcome, enthusiasm for the word does not automatically translate into serious reflection on its meaning. What exactly does or should socialism signify in the present era? In this lecture, I'm going to provide some very preliminary thoughts about how we might develop an answer. That's a, a hedge. I'm not actually going to give you an answer. I'm going to tell you how to develop an answer. OK. Drawing on an expanded conception of capitalism, I'm going to suggest that we need an expanded conception of socialism, which overcomes the narrow economism of received understandings. Disclosing the capitalist economy's contradictory and destructive relations to what I call its non-economic background conditions, I'm going to argue that socialism must do more, much more, in fact, than transform the realm of production. Over and above that desideratum, which of course I wholeheartedly endorse, it must also transform production's relation to its background conditions of possibility, especially to social reproduction, to state power, to non-human nature, and to various forms of social wealth that have lain outside capital's official circuits, but within its reach. I'll explain what I mean by that very soon. In other words, as I'm going to explain, a socialism for our time must overcome not only capital's exploitation of wage labor, but also its free riding on unwaged care work, on public goods, and on wealth expropriated from racialized populations and non-human nature. The result, as I said, will be at least the outlines of some ideas about how to think about an expanded conception of socialism. And I should add something that I meant to write down but forgot, but it's very important. Whatever this is, it's not going to be social democracy, and it's not going to be Soviet communism. OK, let's just be clear about that. OK, so an expanded conception of socialism. Now, expansion, though, is not mere addition. The point is not to add more features to received understandings while leaving the latter unchanged. It is rather to revise our conception of received understandings of socialism by incorporating structural accounts of gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, ecology, and democracy. The result will be to cast a new light on a whole range of very classical topoi of socialist thinking. For example, on the question of property, markets, and planning in socialist societies, on the relation between socially necessary labor, 
free time, and social surplus on emancipation, domination, and crisis. I won't give anything close to a full accounting of any of these matters, let alone all of them, but I aim at least to indicate how they are going to look different, how they assume a different guise, once we view capitalism as something more than an economy, and once, therefore, we view socialism as something more than an alternative economic system. Now, I'm going to begin with capitalism. And this, I think, is the absolutely necessary starting point for any discussion of socialism. Socialism, I mean to say, is no mere ought or utopian dream. If it's worth discussing at all now, it must be rather because it's the crystallization of real historically emergent possibilities of potentials for human freedom and good living, potentials which capitalist society itself has brought into view but cannot itself realize. Put differently, socialism is a response to capitalism's impasses, to the problems it generates non-accidentally and which it cannot solve. Likewise, socialism aims to overcome capitalism's built-in injustices, as well as its structurally grounded social divisions and social conflicts. More generally, socialism aims to remedy capitalism's ills. And so it is there with capitalism that we must begin. Only by identifying capitalism's constitutive dynamics and institutional structure can we grasp exactly what it is that must be transformed. And only by proceeding on that basis can we envision the positive outlines of a socialist alternative. So what exactly is capitalism and what is wrong with it? Often, capitalism is understood narrowly as an, as an economic system, a system whose defining components are markets, private property, especially in the means of production, waged labor, commodity production, exchange transactions, credit, and finance. All of these things, of course, are denominated in money terms, which, and all of them are combined in such a way in a capitalist society as to, as to institutionalize the pursuit of profit as a system imperative, something that must be done. Now, on this view, capitalism coincides with the range of activities, relations, and objects that are directly monetized. Let's call this the narrow or restricted view of capitalism. It's held uh, by most uh, people in the business world, by mainstream economists, and it's the unreflective common sense of our society at large. So more surprisingly, perhaps, even many of capitalism's critics subscribe to this narrow view. Traditional variants of Marxism, for example, understand capitalism as a system of class exploitation centered on the relation between capitalists and workers. That is, between those who own the means of production as their private property, and those who own nothing but their own capacity to work, and who must sell that peculiar commodity, which Marx called labor power, to a capitalist in order to live. This relation, on the view I'm describing, is centered on a market exchange, that is the exchange of labor power for cash wages. But it is not an exchange of equivalents. Rather, the capitalist pays only for the worker's socially necessary labor time, that is the hours needed to cover the costs of the worker's subsistence. The capitalist appropriates the rest of the time the worker works as surplus value. The relation is therefore one of exploitation. That's the technical uh, meaning of that term in Marxism. Class exploitation then is the crux of capitalism on this traditional 
Marxist view. It is the source of profit and rising productivity, but also of poverty, inequality and unemployment, of irrationality, and of periodic outbreaks of economic crisis. Now, the, this traditional Marxist view is a huge improvement, head and shoulders above the standard apologetic views, and yet it is still too narrow. It's not that the view is wrong so much as that it's incomplete. It captures what I like to call the front story of capitalist society while glossing over the back story. The back story, and here actually I should speak in the plural, the back stories, are about the non-economic conditions that make possible the economic front story. Let me mention very briefly four such conditions. First, the unwaged labor of social reproduction, that is the work primarily, but not only, of women in households, in neighborhoods, in civil societies, in some cases in public service institutions. The work that includes housework, child birthing and child raising, care of adult family members, household maintenance, and all the work of preparing either future labor power or replenishing existing labor power, okay? So that's an absolutely necessary, non-economic, non-monetized precondition of economic production in a capitalist economy. Second such condition, expropriated wealth, including, that is, wealth that is not paid for in the same way that the worker's subsistence cost is paid for in exploitation, but that rather is simply seized and stolen or perhaps paid for very much on the cheap. So we're including here not only, uh, sorry, we're including here the labor of racialized populations, whether enslaved, colonized, dispossessed, or uh, super exploited would be one word that people use. And these uh, subjects are those who are not accorded the status of free workers who own their own labor power and must therefore be recompensed at least for the socially necessary costs of their own reproduction. Instead, they are constructed as dependent or unfree others whose property, whose assets, whose persons can simply be seized. Third necessary precondition for a capitalist economy are the so-called free gifts, or if they're not entirely free, at least the cheap inputs from non-human nature, which include such things as supplies of energy, arable land, raw materials, the carbon carrying uh, capacities of the atmosphere, the carbon capturing capacities of carbon sinks, forests, oceans, potable water, et cetera, et cetera. These two are inputs to capitalist production and absolutely necessary preconditions for it, but their reproduction is not paid for, or at least not wholly paid for either. Finally, there are the public goods supplied by states and other public powers, such as law and order, property rights, the money supply, infrastructure, and crisis management, at least in the later stages of capitalist his, uh, capitalism's history. These two are necessary preconditions for a capitalist economy, which are not uh, themselves valued economically or fully uh, reproduced. All four of these things I've just mentioned, social reproduction, expropriated wealth, free gifts of nature, public goods, are absolutely indispensable conditions, as I've said, for a capitalist economy. Without them, there could be no workers, no labor power, no uh, social trust, no social bonds, no material inputs uh, for, for that uh, human labor uh, transforms in the course of work, no infrastructure, no money, etc. cetera. 
So these are integral preconditions for a capitalist economy, and therefore, in my view, part and parcel of what we ought to mean when we talk about a capitalist society. Capitalism, or and I'm, from now on, I'm going to try to remember to use this phrase, capitalist society, which better encompasses what I mean. Capitalist society encompasses these non-economic background conditions, as well as the economy that they make possible. So on the view I've been explaining here, capitalism is not an economy. It is an institutionalized social order that situates a monetized economic zone of interaction into tense, contradictory relations to a set of non-economic zones. It situ situates the economy in relation to the polity, production in relation to reproduction, exploitation in relation to expropriation, human labor in relation to the material substratum on which the labor works, which comes from nature. This is what I mean by an enlarged or expanded view of capitalist society. Now, this view has some important consequences for the present inquiry. It enlarges our sense of what is wrong with capitalism and of what it is that socialism must transform. On the traditional narrow view, there are two main things that are wrong with capitalism. First, it's unjust, and second, it's unsustainable or crisis prone. Both of these are very important ideas, but they are, again, sometimes uh, or usually interpreted too narrowly. On the narrow view of capitalism, the, the, its injustice consists in exploitation. The fact that the worker uh, works many hours for free for the capitalist producing enormous wealth in which she or he does not share, the benefits of which flow to capital. Capital which appropriates the surplus and reinvests it for its own purposes and its own further benefit in an ever-expanding spiral of accumulation. So uh, the um, injustice on this view is essentially a matter of class exploitation in the sphere of production. It is, above all, an economic injustice. The crisis tendencies diagnosed in this view are also essentially economic. The, an economic system that is oriented to limitless accumulation of surplus value, appropriated privately in the form of profit, is internally self-contradictory and self-destabilizing. The drive to increase profit by increasing productivity through technological innovations periodically results in falling profit rates, in the overproduction of goods, the overaccumulation of capital with, with no uh, outlet uh, of investment. Solutions, or I should put that in quote, so supposed solutions like financialization only postpone the day of reckoning while ensuring that it will be all the more severe when it finally comes. In general, as we all know, the course of capitalist development is punctuated by periodic economic crises. It takes the form of boom-bust cycles. Uh, it includes uh, stock market crashes, financial panics, bankruptcy chains, and mass liquidations and mass unemployment. In sum, what's wrong with capitalism on the narrow view is economic class exploitation and a proclivity to economic crisis. Once again, this picture is not so much wrong as incomplete. Once we adopt the expanded view of capitalist society, we see additional injustices and additional crisis tendencies. The expanded view discloses an expanded catalog of systemic injustices. First, the social uh, structural institutionalization of a fundamental division between two types of necessary social labor, economic production remunerated by wages and social reproduction remunerated supposedly by love. This, of course, is a gendered division 
And in a society in which money is the end all and be all, it's obvious that its institutionalization entrenches a strong gender asymmetry and form of gender subordination. It is, in my view, the most important structural basis of women's subordination in capitalist society, a condition that is not accidental, but structurally hardwired. Second, capitalist societies also institute a fundamental division between free exploited workers and dependent expropriated others. The former, as I mentioned, are positioned as rights-bearing citizens who can be exploited but not otherwise violated with impunity. They have the ability to call on states to uh, um, affirm their rights, vindicate their rights. The, in, the, in contrast, the dependent subjects are vulnerable to violation. They are the source of a stream of cheap inputs that swell the tide of profit. And they have trouble claiming any rights or protections from violation. They are, this dis division has historically and still today coincided with the global color line. And I think that race has a great deal to do with this idea of being viable, vulnerable to violation and expropriation. So um, here uh, we see then uh, the institutionalization in this di distinction between expropriation and exploitation, which imbricate in a capitalist economy. There is no profitable exploitation without a background of expropriation. Right? And this division then maps, as I said, onto the global color line and therefore onto a range of related injustices, racial impression, uh, direct rule colonialism, other forms of imperialism and neo-imperialism, indigenous expropriation and genocide. Third, Capitalist societies also institute a fundamental division between human labor and its material substratum, which no longer seem to belong to the same ontological universe. Nature is reduced to a tap and a sink it, and is open to extractivism and instrumentalization. If this is not an injustice against nature or against non-human creatures in nature, and I'm going to be agnostic about that, it is at the very least an injustice against future generations of human beings who are left with a hell of a mess. Capitalist societies also, fourth point, so we see there's a, a, a set of injustices above and beyond class exploitation, hardwired, structurally entrenched injustices. Finally, Capitalist societies institute a fundamental division between private economic power, which is the power of capital to organize production for its own profit, and public political power, which is the power of states and, and, uh, and other public institutions to rule through law and a supposed mon monopoly on so-called legitimate violence. Now, one thing uh, that is built in here is a truncation, a, a, a shrinking of the scope of the political, of the scope of issues that can be subject to democratic collective decision making and control. To expel from the political agenda a whole set of questions about the organization of production, about our relation to nature, about the relation of production to social reproduction. All of these things mean a weakening and a shrinking of democracy. This is a major political injustice that is hardwired into capitalist society, rendering citizens as subject to private powers over which they have no say. All of the most important questions, what 
exactly we produce and how much, on what energic basis, on the, on the basis of what kinds of social relations and for whose benefit, what we do with the social surplus, if any, we produce, all of these questions are off the table. So we see some fundamental political injustice if you believe that democracy means the right to a say in the conditions to which you are subject. So, on an expanded view of capitalist society, all these injustices are structural. They are every bit as deep-seated and as non-accidental as class exploitation. A socialist alternative to capitalist society must therefore remedy them too. It must change not only the organization of the economy or of production as economically defined, but it must also change the relation of production to reproduction and it must end uh, capital's reliance on the expropriation of nature's so-called free gifts and on the wealth of racialized populations. Socialism must also expand the scope of democracy beyond the miserable limits and confines that capitalism places on it. If socialism is a remedy for capitalism's injustices, it needs to change not just the capitalist economy, but the entire institutionalized social order that is a capitalist society. But that is not all. The expanded view of capitalism also enlarges our view of what counts as a capitalist crisis. This view discloses some built-in self-destabilizing propensities above and beyond those internal to the capitalist economy. These propensities include a structural inclination to social reproductive crisis as capital tries to avoid paying for unwaged care work, the very uh, activity on which it depends. Hence, we see in its history periodic stresses on family life, periodic downturns in the birth rate, and especially uh, acute today, a kind of pincer attack from two sides simultaneously in which finance capital demands state disinvestment in social welfare, which had been built up in the previous era in part as a kind of support for social reproduction. That's one side of the pincer movement. The other side is the recruitment massively of women into waged work, long hours of grueling, low-paid service work especially. You put these two things together defunding of public support for social reproduction, demanding that the historic providers of it, namely women, spend their time devoted to, uh, to accumulation in the wage sphere, and you have a, a real uh, crunch as we see today. So, tendency, built-in tendency to social reproductive crisis which periodically becomes acute. Third, uh, a tendency, no sorry, second, a tendency to ecological crisis as capital tries to avoid paying the full replacement costs of the inputs it takes from nature, resulting in things like soil depletion, resource depletion, depletion of the atmosphere's ca carbon carrying capacity, the overwhelming of carbon sinks, Capital helps itself to all of these things without e accounting their ecological reproduction costs. It assumes, as it were, that nature is just infinite and can replenish itself ad infinitum without limits, a proposition we now know to be clearly false. As a result, capitalism periodically destabilizes the metabolic interaction between human beings and the rest of nature, leaving a trail of wreckage in its, waste, uh, in its wake. And today, of course, we know an especially acute outbreak of ecological crisis, above all in the fact of global warming. Third, 
Capitalism's tendency to ecological and social reproductive crises are inseparable from its reliance on expropriated wealth from racialized people and its reliance on stolen lands, constrained and coerced or, uh, bodies, confiscated labor, confiscated animals, tools, reproductive capacities. Its reliance on racialized regions and zones also as a dumping ground for its toxic waste, hence environmental racism and global care chains where it imports right, cheap reproductive uh, labor to replace the work uh, previously done without pay for working mothers. So here we see an intertwining of the ecological, the, eco uh, the economic, the social reproduction, and, and the racial ethnic antagonisms in a new form of crisis. Finally, we can't uh, avoid mentioning capital's proclivity to generate political crises, both crises of governance and crises of hegemony. Capitalism tries to have it both ways. It lives off public goods while trying to avoid paying taxes and to weaken state regulatory capacity to hollow out public power. Today, um, let's see, yeah. Today, globally uh, mega corporations, as, as Colin Crouch uses a great phrase, oligarchical oligarchalistic mega corporations with a global reach by far outgun the territorial states who might have once claimed to be able to rein them in. This is an especially acute issue now with financialization as financial markets and investors take it upon themselves to discipline states, no longer to be disciplined by them, but to tell states what they can and cannot spend money on and uh, to how much and so on and so forth, thereby hobbling state capacities to solve our problems and especially to rein in capital. The result of this crisis of governance, which we see in full force, for example, in the EU, um, the result is today a major crisis of hegemony in contemporary capitalism. The delegitimation of neoliberal thinking, both progressive neoliberal thinking and reactionary neoliberal thinking, and the rise of an astounding uh, wave, uh, international wave of populisms, populisms of the right and of the left, which want something other than neoliberalism. Okay, in general, Capitalist society harbors multiple crisis tendencies above and beyond the merely economic. These are not so much intra-economic, these other tendencies, as intra-realm contradictions between the economy and its background conditions of possibility. Capital, as I said, has a built-in tendency to erode, destroy, deplete, destabilize its own conditions of possibility, to eat its own tail. This too is part of what is wrong with capitalist society and what socialism must try to overcome. In sum, not just class exploitation, but also gender subordination, racial ethnic imperial domination, ecological predation and political injustice. Likewise, not just economic crisis, but also social reproduction crisis, e ecological crisis, political crisis, and so on. Now this means that the project of rethinking socialism for the 21st century is pretty big. It's a tall order. Far too big, obviously, for a single person in the space of a single lec lecture, or frankly, even having all the time in the world. Uh, and even uh, far too big for any group of thinkers. If this project is developed at all, as I hope it will be, it will be through a combination of activism and theorizing, an, a, in which the insights uh, um, that are gained through the practical experience of uh, social struggle, 
are able to fertilize and to synergize with conceptual programmatic thinking and political organization. Nevertheless, a few things can be said even now to clarify at least some aspects of this project. I want to briefly discuss what I think of are four important principles that must guide our thinking as we see uh, about trying to build or envision a socialist project. And these are, uh, just to name them quickly, the principles of non-domination, of the democratization of what I'll call boundary problems, of sustainability, which is a principle uh, of anti-free riding, pay as you go, and democratic control over social surplus. Let me explain uh, these um, quickly. Now, um, beginning with the uh, anti-domination uh, principle. And what this requires is that whatever it is, socialism has to overcome those so-called hidden forms of structurally entrenched domination. That has to be a priority. It's a deal breaker. I just mentioned a whole set of uh, forms of domination entrenched in capitalist societies that need to be abolished just as uh, exploitation uh, and domination based upon it must be. This means that uh, the larger social matrix in which all these forms of domination are embedded must be re-envisioned. Okay, so um, let me see if I can shorten this a little bit. In the case of um, reproductive labor, what we need, I would say, in a nutshell, is to overcome the whole gender division of reproductive labor, as well as the split between so-called productive labor and reproductive labor. All of this is socially necessary work and needs to be considered together and treated as on a par. That doesn't necessarily mean, as I'll suggest in a moment, something like wages for housework. It's not about universalizing wage work, but about thinking about some other way of dealing with this. In addition, um, not just exploitation, but also expropriation must be uh, abolished. We're also talking about the need to overcome democratic deficits by changing the relation of economy to polity, and especially with respect to social surplus, as I'll explain in just a few minutes. We're also talking about overcoming intergenerational injustices that reside in ecological uh, predation and uh, all of those related things. Okay. What all, what all of this is to say, in short, is that we're talking about transforming the economy's relation to its four fundamental background conditions. In some cases, this could mean actually abolishing a particular institutional division or separation. In others, it might mean redrawing the boundary in a different place, or it might mean softening the boundary without abolishing it fully. There are lots of, of ways to think about this, and I can't go into detail here. But the crucial point is that we are talking about making reflective collective decisions about how we want to handle the basic shape of the institutionalized social order. We're, we're not going to accept having these things decided behind our back as a result of the private ownership of the means of production in a system oriented to private profit. OK, um, let me. Um, I have a, a whole bunch of stuff here about why we don't want a command economy, but I, I think it's probably obvious enough. Some of the 
promises, uh, promising aspects, but also deficiencies of attempts to think about council communism, uh, most of which are focused on factory councils and therefore replicate the narrow view. A brilliant exception is Sylvia Pankhurst's 1920 essay with the extraordinary title, A Constitution for British Soviets. I love it, 1920. Uh, which proposes uh, uh, housework councils in addition to factory councils. That's quite interesting. Um, okay, look, um, I, 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 we're talking about a whole set of, um, yeah. Of, of boundary issues and how to think about them. As I say, I'm going to um, leave the, the details aside right now. Okay, let me uh, go now to my third principle, which is sustainability, anti-free riding, pay as you go. A socialist society must undertake to replace and replenish all the wealth it uses up in its own social production and social reproduction. It must replenish care work, that is the work of people making, if you like, or, and so on, just as it replenishes work that produces use values. It must also replace all the wealth it takes from the quote unquote outside, from nature and from peripheral societies and populations who remain either distant from or outside its central official orbit. It must uh, repair and replace um, all the political capacities and public goods it draws on in the course of meeting its other needs. It can't hollow out public power. And it must, um, uh, the, the idea then is that it must um, end free riding. This proviso is the sine qua non for overcoming, obviously, the intergenerational injustices endemic to capitalist societies. Uh, we're talking then about free riding on nature here. It is also a necessary, though, to overcome the multiple crisis tendencies that are built into capitalism, the ones that I just explained. Okay, a fourth and last principle I want to suggest is democratic control over social surplus. What I mean by surplus here is whatever wealth, whatever use values the society can generate in excess of what it requires to reproduce itself at the given level at which it finds itself in history. In capitalist society, as we saw, Surplus is treated as the private property of the capitalist class and is invested by its owners as they see fit, which generally means with an aim to producing yet more surplus on and on and on without limit in a spiral of accumulation. And this, as I said, is both unjust and self-destabilizing. So, a socialist society must democratize control over social surplus. It must allocate surplus democratically, deciding collectively ex exactly what to do with the excess, as well as how much of it to produce. Indeed, whether to produce any at all, it might decide simply to work a lot less and be content with the same level of social reproduction. In other words, socialism much, must treat those questions I listed before as political questions. What and how much to produce, how many hours to devote to surplus production over and above the work needed to reproduce society at its current level, how much free time we should allow ourselves, and how much work time. What projects, improvements, uh, aspirations to do something better, to progress, should we invest our surplus labor capacities in? In scientific research, in labor-saving technology, in more labor-intensive care work? There are lots of possibilities here. As I said, surplus time means time that's left after basic needs at social reproduction are met. <clears throat> 
It is time that could be free time. Free for what? For art, for creative activity, for relaxing, for socializing, for taking it easy. Uh, who's to say? Now, in the early stages of socialism, I actually doubt that surplus time would loom very large at all. The reason has to do with the enormous unpaid bill that socialist society would inherit from capitalism. Although capitalism prides itself on its productivity, and although Marx himself thought it was a veritable engine for producing social surplus, I have my doubts. The reason is that Marx reckoned surplus pretty much exclusively in terms of the labor time that capital takes from waged workers after they produce value sufficient to cover their own immediate cost of living. And you'll recall that that is Marx's definition of surplus value. By contrast, he paid much less attention to the various free gifts and cheaps that capital expropriated or, uh, or appropriated, and still less to its failure to cover their reproduction costs. What if we included this, those social costs in our reckoning? What if capital had to pay for f the free reproductive work, for the ecological repair and replenishment of the damage it creates, for the expropriated wealth of racialized subject peoples, for the public goods uh, on which it freely draws? How much surplus would capitalism really have produced if it actually had had to pay for all those things? That's a rhetorical question, of course, because I myself wouldn't know how even to begin to arrive at an answer. But I do believe there are some feminists and environmental economists who are actually thinking about what these things really cost. In any case, a socialist society would inherit a hefty bill for centuries of unpaid ecological reproduction costs, expropriation costs, and uh, so on and so forth, for, as well as a hefty bill for massive, unmet, basic human needs across the globe. Needs for health care, for shelter or housing, for transportation, for education, for food security and nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. These two can't really be counted as surplus investment, but rather as absolute necessities. And the same holds for the pressing and enormous job of defossilizing the world economy, shifting the enti its entire basis to renewable energy. That's hardly, at this point, a surplus luxury that we could decide to forego. So the question of what is surplus and what is necessary leads me to one further observation, which concerns uh, a question I posed earlier about the role and character of property and of markets in a socialist society. I think both those things, private property and markets, have little or no place at either the very top of the society or at the very bottom, but they might play a role in the in-between. What I mean by the top is that question I raised about the allocation of social surplus. Assuming there is a surplus to be allocated, it must be considered the collective wealth of the society as a whole. No private person or entity can own it. It's impossible to say who contributed exactly how much to it. We're talking about the production of what some Italian uh, Marxist thinkers call the general intellect, for example. It cannot be uh, attributed uh, individually. Uh, no uh, private person, therefore, can have the right to dispose of it. Surplus is truly collective property to be allocated through a collective process of self-determination, which must somehow, I can't say how, be organized democratically. Thus, market mechanisms should have no role whatsoever at this level, neither markets nor private property at the top. The same holds, I want to claim, for the bottom, by which I mean the level of basic human needs. Again, shelter, clothing, food, education, transport, healthcare, leisure, etc. 
I have no illusions that we can specify now or once and for all what exactly counts as a basic need and what exactly is required to satisfy it on a global scale. That too must be a subject for democratic deliberation and decision making. But whatever is decided must be provided as a matter of right and not on the basis of ability to pay. Here is where the principle from each according to his abilities or her abilities to each according to her needs rings true. This means that the use values we produce to meet these needs cannot be commodities. They must rather be public goods. So no markets at the bottom just as at the top, no private property either. This is why, incidentally, I am not a big fan of universal basic income, which is something that a lot of people find uh, progressive. It involves paying people cash so that they can buy the stuff they need to meet their basic needs. So it treats basic need satisfactions as commodities produced privately for private profit. Socialists should reject this view and should treat these goods as public goods, as I have said. So, no private ownership or market exchange at the bottom and at the top. What about the in-between? I don't have a worked out principled view about this matter, but I imagine the in-between as a space for experimentation with a mix of different possibilities. So this would be the place where something like market socialism could be considered. Perhaps a socialist society could encompass small or medium-sized enterprises, preferably worker-owned, which could organize supply chains with one another on a market basis. They might also sell some uh, stuff they produce, I'm not talking about things that are needed to satisfy basic needs, to consumers. The owners could be paid for the work of organizing this production in the form of a stipulated percentage, which might be considered the equivalent of a profit. But they would not have the unilateral right to invest their profits in any way uh, that they, um, their fancy dictated. They couldn't, for example, buy coal to burn as energy to power machinery. Just to take an example, they could not necessarily dispose of their property uh, in the free market. Nor would they control that portion, if any, of the total social surplus that they might try to claim should be credited to them for reasons I already explained. My idea is that once the top and the bottom are socialized and decommodified, then the whole question of the role of markets and the role of property in the middle is going to take on a completely different valence and character than it does from our perspective in a capitalist society. And that's why I have a looser feeling about what might be possible there. I think the whole question gets transformed and I'm pretty sure that it gets transformed even if I can't say exactly how. Okay, um, in fact, um, I have to say that I realize how thin and rudimentary is the view of socialism I've been sketching here. It's not even really a view, a set of principles and a set of a way of thinking about things. It's only the barest beginning uh, and of a few ideas. But I hope that even this poor beginning can have some value. I hope specifically that it convinces you that the socialist project is worth pursuing, that socialism is not simply a de passe relic nor a fashionable buzzword, but the name for a genuine alternative to the system that is destroying the planet and is uh, mocking our capacities for it living well and freely in a democratic way. I also hope that I have convinced you
that socialism cannot be broached in the old school way based on correcting a restricted set of problems that are deduced from a restricted view of what capitalism is. Only by starting with an expanded view of capitalism and by proceeding from there to develop an expanded view of socialism can we envision a conception that can speak to our full set of concerns and needs at the present time. If I have pers persuaded you of that, and if I have inspired you to want to pursue this project further, I will have considered this lecture, despite its evident defects, a success. Thank you. Hi, thank you for such a. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm Andre Stevens. I'm a PhD candidate here in sociology. Uh, thank you for such a wonderful and thought provoking lecture. Uh, there are a couple questions that I had uh, based on some of what you said. Uh, the first one related to um, you sort of described the evolution from, I'm going to call it the Keynesian version mm -hmm. of uh, capitalism, which focused a lot on social reproduction, um, to this sort of more f financialized version. Mm -hmm. Uh, in which there wouldn't be any sort of mechanism for social reproduction. You talked about sort of having women occupy the space of low wage work, yeah. but also having, um, I suppose, immigrants come in to sort of replace um, a lot of workers who I think would be relegated to marginalization. And so I was curious about what you saw as uh, social reproduction within that context. Um, and then my second question related to the sort of rise of financial speculation mm -hmm. in a world where uh, Jeff Bezos announces that he might get divorced and that causes billions of dollars of wealth to be right. erased from Amazon. Um, this notion of um, workers producing sort of surplus value and that surplus value being democratized. Um, so much of what financial capitalism is about is about sort of projecting into the future um, speculation about wealth. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just curious about how we democratize that version of yeah. wealth, not creation, but sort of wealth speculation right. um, within this framework of, of socialism. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, question, and you're absolutely right. You've sort of read, in a sense, between the lines, because there is a historical uh, hypothesis in the background of what I said that is this shift from what you called a Keynesian form of capitalism, I would call it a state-managed form, to this financialized, globalizing, uh, neoliberal capitalism in which capital escapes the regulatory capacities of states upon which the previous uh, form depended. And, um, I quite agree that in, in state-managed capitalism, or you could call it social democratic capitalism or New Deal capitalism, um, one thing that happens is that states step in to try to rescue capital from itself, in part by shoring up the depleted capacities for social reproduction that the earlier laissez-faire version was has you know is just taking people and chewing them up and spitting them out and you know they, 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 there's no ability to actually uh, the, the working class is almost unable to reproduce itself in that previous model and um, so one thing that social democracy does is say okay we're going to step in capital won't do it we the state uh, will do it and that um, as you suggested is all being undone today. Um, and the result then is um, this big squeeze on all of that necess socially necessary activity uh, 
that states are backing off from and that the traditional providers no longer have the time or energy, the capacity to provide at the same level. So you're quite, quite right that uh, one uh, solution is to bring in uh, low-waged immigrants, usually women of color, with uh, very uh, with virtually no uh, labor rights, uh, who are vulnerable to right all kinds of uh, abuses and so on. Um, unfortunately, this is this is like the hidden underside of what passes for women's liberation today in the middle and upper middle classes in the professional managerial strata, who where you know women are able to climb the corporate ladder because. Sheryl Sandberg says they're leaning in. I say they're leaning on this expropriated uh, other labor. Um, financial speculation, I mean, um, there's so much to say uh, about that. I mean, one thing to say is that in this phase of capitalism, capital has stopped paying even mainstream free exploited workers the full cost, socially average, average necessary cost of their own reproduction, the cost of living. And the solution uh, to declining wages, which threatens consumption and therefore threatens profits, has been consumer debt. So I'm sure plenty of people in this audience know all about student debt, credit card debt. Some of you may know about payday loans, obviously home mortgages and so on and so forth, um, all of which uh, really mean that even waged workers are not able to live on current wages. They're borrowing against future wages, which they hope will materialize. And we see this same uh, dynamic in the global south, or even in the south of Europe, uh, where with sovereign debt, uh, which um, basically means eviscerating uh, pensions, which people held as legal rights, uh, and, you know, which, and, and um, closing hospitals and uh, basically killing people at the behest of central banks and investors. So this is a part of a huge shift, uh, right, in, uh, from that portion of the social product that went to at least the official working class now being drained to capital. This is no longer really only exploitation. It's exploitation overlaid with expropriation because they're drilling into bone here. Um, I think uh, from everything I said, a socialist uh, society is certainly uh, not going to do that. And, I, and, and you asked about financial speculation. I don't think uh, a socialist society can have financial speculation at all. But it certainly needs and should have credit, right? The ability to fund projects that are promising in the sense of potentially socially valuable on a broad scale, allocating credit not according to what some investor thinks he or she can make money off of, but rather according to the social validity or value of the project. So I think uh, credit, I'm following Robin Blackburn here, should become a public utility just as electricity in some socialist cities was a public utility at one point. Uh, and this too brings into play this democratic uh, side that you know, the decision makers have to be uh, elected, accountable, have to have lots of uh, room for input. One could think about participatory budgeting as you know, uh, the beginnings of a model for how to uh, incorporate right, uh, a wide set of perspectives into thinking about this. So I don't think the issue of speculation, but credit sh is important to, to a socialist society. So another question? Yes, please. You stand There's up? a woman here who, yeah. Hmm. Uh, excellent uh, presentation. It's very good, very clear. Um, I uh, 
was with you entirely until you started um, mentioning uh, market socialism. Mm -hmm. And um, the concern I have, and I know you can't go over everything, but right. the, the concern I have is um, what a lot of people today, what people have been talking about is where are, what is the, what is the um, import, the impact of markets, what are the mm -hmm. impact of markets, Good. and what are right. the um, what is the role of money in a socialist society? Right. And one of the concerns I have about this middle stratum that you referred to, mm -hmm. uh, where there would be markets, et cetera, or there might be markets, uh, is yeah. that um, we're talking about the uh, pernicious act, the pernicious role of um, of uh, fetishism. Yeah. That, that markets aren't a, a thing, capital is not a thing, and money is not a thing, but they're social relations right. that involve competition, involve atomization, etc. Yeah. So I would be very interested to hear what you Good. have to say about that. Good. So you're absolutely right that there's a, an important strand of uh, critical theory, of anti-capitalist thought that focuses on the alienation, the reification, the, the fetishism that um, they claim, right, is like built into the money form. So anytime you are buying something with money, you are, you're, it, it, it changes the grammar of the thing, it changes your relation to it, it changes your relation to the person you transact with, which becomes a, um, what does post -own call it? A relation of dissociated sociality and in indifference is a word Marx uses a lot. Um, you're, you're somehow, you have personal independence, Marx says, based on ob thoroughgoing objective dependence uh, and indifference. So this is maybe not a great kind of sociality for, in a qualitative sense. Um, I think this is too one-sided. It's not wholly wrong, but I really here am more convinced by the thought of Georg Zimmel, who I think explains the trade-offs. Um, that personal independence is, you know, is, is an important uh, positive good. So for example, do you really want to spend a great deal of time kind of chatting up the guy you're buying a pair of shoes from, getting to or getting a relationship of non-indifference. Well, life is short. Um, I think money is uh, no. My, my, in so far as money, what what does a monetary transaction mean? It means that you can opt out of take of taking. Uh, everything as a topic at which, as a Habermasian would say, you must be oriented to reaching agreement. If you had to reach agreement about everything, um, you know, your life would be just one interminable meeting. <laughs> and I, th I think that in, as money can be very liberating from all of that. It's simply a device that gives you a shortcut we live in a very complex society. It's a, it is a mass society. And in a situation like that, uh, you want some way of an anonymizing uh, some interactions, provided that this doesn't bring with it entrenched relations of domination, the inability of some people to meet their basic needs, the uh, usurpation by uh, private wealth of the right to determine the, the, the basic, you want to determine the basic contours of your society, not every little transaction. If you can get the structure right, then you don't have to worry about every little transaction. That's how I see it. So that's why I don't have a principled objection to all markets. And I'm also a follower of the guy I call the other Carl, Polanyi, who usefully pointed out that you know, all sorts of things count as markets. The markets have existed in virtually every society. What we don't want are so-called self-regulating markets, unregulated markets, markets that are subject to no 
political, moral, religious, cultural, normative constraints, but only to the mechanical play of, of, play of supply and demand. Um, but markets that are tightly regulated with all, in, in light of all the various values and principles that I've discussed, might not be a bad option in some areas. But we have to decide which. And that definitely, that question, which areas, is a question for a democratic uh, dis debate and decision making. It's not something that should be decided behind our backs. Higher education? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> There's a um, woman who's been, Kathy, there's a woman who's been trying to talk here. Does she want to talk first? I want to go yeah. to this side. Oh, okay. okay. Hi, I'm Kailash. I'm a political science student. Um, first, I, I wanted to give a quick defense of the councilist position. Mm -hmm. you, seemed, you said that the councilists wanted to divide factory and society. It seemed like you were hinting. The whole point of the councilists was, um, yeah. that the factory councils would be the vehicle by which more aspects of society would be over workers' control. So it seems like the opposite of what you were indicating. Um, but my question is, why exactly would not a social democracy be entailed by your vision? You retain most of the capitalist social form, wage, labor, market, money, competition. Um, well, I don't understand exactly why you would want to go, what differs this and then like a full-throated version of social democracy as found in, I don't know, the early social democratic tradition. Got, got it. So um, I'm not sure I got your point about factory councils because um, in, as I understand it, the, um, the stakeholders in decisions, even in the very local decisions uh, made by a, a factory council about how to operate its own operation, would include people in the neighborhood, people who are raising kids uh, and educating them, and so on and so forth. It can't be a council made up of only the workers in a factory if its job is to figure out how to run that factory. There are other stakeholders. Um, and of course, um, I mean, that's this, the point about Pankhurst and the um, house, what does she call it, housewives or household uh, councils. Um, they're, they're need, if they're going to be councils, then they need to have, as their job, right, uh, uh, operating a whole bunch of things besides factories. and they. And the various stakeholders cross-cut. It's not just the people who are directly doing that activity, but those who are affected by it. Um, but on your other point, um, well, I actually didn't uh, uh, speak about labor markets. And certainly, uh, democratic control over social surplus, the elimination of the private appropriation of surplus, if anything counts as non-capitalist, that is the crux. That is the absolute crux. Um, so I don't uh, agree that this is some sort of warmed over version of uh, social democracy. And you pointed to, yes, yeah. please. Yes. Would you stand up and introduce yourself? Thank you. Here comes the mic. The mic is loud enough. It's coming. It's not. Okay. Um, yeah, my name is Katherine Karcher. I'm an undergraduate in political science. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, um, I've sort of found in a lot of socialist organizations basically that the idea seems to be that capitalism is like the root of all evils. Um, and you've named sort of these like precepts of capitalism really just like racialization and gendering. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering sort of if you, um, how this sort of like transformation of capitalist society would necessarily undo all, yes. like not necessarily all yeah. forms of real estate. You get it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I go do. for it. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a, actually a complicated question, so I appreciate your posing it. I mean, first of all, um, 
certainly in the case of gender oppression, this long predates capitalist society. The idea is not that capitalism invented it. I think on the question of racial oppression, you might actually make the case that, okay, we have the impurity of the blood in 1492 in Spain, but you know, it really is the dispossession of so-called new world peoples and the uh, institution of racialized slavery and so on that creates modern uh, racism. So I think there, there's a, a case to be made. In the case of gender, it's not that, uh, that capitalism creates something out of thin air, but it thoroughly transforms the nature of gender asymmetry. And if we want to eliminate that gender asymmetry today, we have to know what undergirds it now, not what was behind it you know, in ancient Egypt or uh, some other place. Um, so, um, so do I think capitalism is the root of all evil? No. The point is, I mean, you, you have to decide sort of what your priorities are. My priorities for thinking about socialism uh, have to do with overcoming the structural basis that entrenches these relations in a persistently unjust way. There could, there could be holdovers, psychic, you know, people with bad thoughts about women or people of color or trans people or whatever. Um, there could be all kinds of holdovers, and then you sort of have to decide how much you're going to get into the nitty gritty of um, micro, you know, how, uh, behavioral engineering, et cetera, et cetera, uh, of that kind of stuff, um, because it does carry, right, a, a cost at the level of a certain, um, tendency towards, uh, yeah, illiberal authoritarianism that even uh, that a socialist society, I, I mean, want to in endorse that, that side of liberalism, right? So um, I think for me, the key question is, does this rise to the level, this, this would sort of go back to uh, a, a norm I used in earlier work, does this rise to the level that it impedes the possibility of parity of participation in social life? If so, then it has to be addressed. If it's something that you know is um, unpleasant and annoying and possibly even infuriating, but it's going to die out, you know, it, it it might be the better part of wisdom to sort of take a light hand. But no structurally entrenched material basis. I, I don't know for sure, but I believe that if you uh, could design a society without those things, I, I think that um, things would right themselves in due course. Not immediately, but in due course. In due course. I'm going to actually <laughs> close the discussion okay. for now, but okay. remind everyone that you will be at Town Hall for Red May Seattle mm. on Friday night and University Bookstore at 3 on Saturday. And I want to thank you all for coming and bringing your minds and your hearts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.